Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Red Raptor Writes. In the past, we've looked at some pretty bad dinosaur documentaries, but usually they're at least entertainingly bad. Clash of the Dinosaurs though, this one hurt. Easily the most boring one I've had to sit through yet. This is that show that only animates like 10 scenes, then loops them for 40 minutes. Oh, then they think that mirroring the footage counts as new footage. But then you have to sit down for not just one or two episodes, but four. Four episodes of the same footage and same information getting repeated again and again and again until we're both dead. That's not to mention the Last Day of the Dinosaurs DLC, Discovery released the next year. Thankfully, I'm only judging these things based on accuracy. So let's hope Clash can redeem itself here. <laughs> like that's ever gonna happen. Oh, I Let's dig this up. Let's start this off on a positive note like always. I'm gonna need some sunshine and rainbows to wake myself up. Just be prepared to see the same shots on repeat. Quetzalcoatlus isn't a dinosaur of course, but is cool enough to be an honorary member of the club, being the largest animal to ever fly. One thing Discovery Channel gets right is that, well, for decades this pterosaur was assumed to be a scavenger, soaring around using its superior senses to locate carrion. There was also a significant push for a skim feeding hypothesis that we see often in documentaries, but there's too little footage for me to ever mention it. Well, Clash of the Dinosaurs throws these ideas out, showing a flyer in line with a 2008 study from Mark Witten and Darren Nash. These authors argued that Quetzalcoatlus, along with its as darkened relatives, were terrestrial predators, feeding on small land vertebrates, like dino babies. Another big win here is how we see it actually fly. It's been a subject of debate for years whether it was actually able to fly, although, to be fair, the controversy didn't start until after this release. Just a few months ago, in the December of 2021, came the Great Quetzal monograph with several papers being released and accessible. Link in the description because there's way too much to cover here. But both terrestrial feeding and fully powered flight are heavily supported, gaining lift through strong flight strokes and support from their legs. They were more than capable of lifting themselves off the ground. Now onto the dinosaurs in the Dino Doc. Uh, now eventually you do plan to have dinosaurs on your on your dinosaur tour, right? Hello? Ah, Jeff Goldblum, you're the best. Throughout the repetitive four episodes, lots of attention goes to the dino senses, which are pretty accurate. Ankylosaurids were great sniffers with an enlarged olfactory bulb, the part of the brain used to process smells. This would have allowed them to detect predators from a distance. To help the famous hadrosaurid Parasaurolophus, they had those recognizable crests that were capable of producing low frequency sounds and an inner ear capable of picking up those sounds. The great vision perk is given to Deinonychus which is probably accurate. While I couldn't find a paper specifically noting their visual acuity, I know there is a 2011 paper on some of its relatives like Velociraptor and their scleral rings suggesting that their eyes were suited for low light conditions. Hopefully it isn't too much of a jump to assume that this was the case for Deinonychus as well. But of course the Tyrannosaurus was way overpowered in all these areas with some of the best vision, scent, and hearing to ever grace this planet. This is no exaggeration, it had the best gear in the animal kingdom, being able to pick up low frequencies and smell for miles, allowing it to find its prey. Plus, it needed that binocular vision and enhanced depth perception to help judge the distance of how far a trike's horns are from its face. Excellent work here, guys. While we're on the subject of hunting, I appreciate Peter Larson's input that T-Rex acted as both a predator and a scavenger when it needed to be. Yeah, we've had enough of that Horner scavenger crap. Thanks, Larson, for the real talk. For an 8-ton behemoth, it couldn't be picky about what it ate. To maintain that immense size, T-Rex needed to eat a lot, so why the heck would it pass up on a free meal? Yeah. <coughs> when do we get the free food? But of course, they hunted the herbivores in their environment such as Edmontosaurus annectins, Triceratops, Taurosaurus, Ankylosaurus, and if its range extended southward enough, maybe a vulnerable Alamosaurus. 
If engaged in a head-to-head -head fight, as Dr. Thomas Holtz correctly points out, Tyrannosaurus would have lost more than it won. Most hunts from modern predators aren't successful. This was probably the case in the late Cretaceous as well. Clash of the Dinosaurs gets even more right about the Tyrant Lizard. A more conservative bite force of 7,000 pounds of force is given, although some estimates can be as high as approaching 13,000 pounds of force. So not only was its prey being stabbed, but essentially hit with a truck. Another decent estimate is stated that their top speed would have been about 15 miles an hour, a little bit slower than a fit person. If the new year wasn't enough to motivate you to exercise, then remember T-Rex can only catch people who are out of shape. Be prepared for when we clone these suckers. We've talked about this predator at length on the channel already, so to wrap this up, it's nice to see the correct hands. For the Rex at least, they're not pronated, plus the second digit is shown to be longer than the first. Good attention to detail. This seems to be the Great as Darkit episode, which is a fun change of pace. While the pile of 2021 papers largely confirmed a lot of what we see here, there are two details that need an update. In many cases, I would support the wing membranes extending down to attach at the ankles. It's what we see here, but unfortunately for Discovery, it's now been suggested that in Quetzalcoatlus, they attached only at the body. The legs would have been free and tucked underneath the body during flight. Also, these guys are slightly undersized, being called 400 pounds. Newer estimates now give them a weight between 440 and 550 pounds. Strange to think a plain-sized animal had the same weight as a grizzly bear. Although we've only just started the outdated section, it's time to wrap it up by discussing the Ankylosaurus snoot. It is correctly pointed out in the show that Ankylosaurus would have been like its cousin Euoplocephalus in having these complex looping nasal passages with an increased surface area. While it is possible that these were used to enhance their sense of smell, it more likely helped ankylosaurs with heat and water balance. These strange passages also might have helped resonate sounds or a combination of these things. Whatever the case may be, it's a cool secret feature of a beloved dinosaur. Alright then, keep your secrets. Good. I truly am a fan of most of what Discovery did with the T-Vex and Cretaceous biplane, but somehow, so much goes wrong here. Let's look at Deinonychus, one of my favorite dinosaurs along with Ceratosaurus, Acrocanthosaurus, Styracosaurus, Pachy- Okay, I have a lot of favorites, but Deinonychus is definitely up there. Yeah, it's cool to see some sort of feathering, but it's the wrong kind. Us audiences see them covered in downy plumage, when really they had contour feathers along the body and wings from flight feathers. I guess the creators wanted to brag about being accurate with feathering, but didn't really care. I didn't care. Many of those old raptor tropes show up again too, as if the series just had to appeal to Jurassic Park fans. Yeah, it's controversial, but I'll keep saying it. Just because specimens were found together, it doesn't mean that they lived and hunted together. There are other, more likely scenarios as to how their remains converged. Also, there's the trope of the infamous sickle claws, how they were used to slice into the flesh of their prey, disemboweling it. Yeah, no. Those thin, unsharpened hooks could not slice through a sauropod's thick flesh. Maybe it's death by a thousand paper cuts. Dromaeosaurids, or raptors, probably used their talons to seize small prey, climb, or perform raptor prey restraint. RPR is a hypothetical killing tactic which involves leaping onto their meal's back, hooking on with their claws, and flapping their wings for stability as the mouth inflicts serious damage. Despite Dromaeosaurus literally meaning running lizard, this theropod, along with its relatives, were probably not the best runners. Clash says Deinonychus ran up to 40 miles per hour. But I love how Dr. Holtz tries to pivot away from this, being the voice of reason. Deinonychus is agile and can reach speeds of 40 miles per hour. It would have been swift. It would have been swifter than a human being, certainly. But its real ability would have been agility. Look, man, as hard as you tried, there was no saving this. Poor guy, Holtz keeps finding himself in these terrible documentaries. Remember when he was the voice of reason in the Nanotyrannus debate, but was instantly shut down? 
prepared a little breakfast. I was meant to inspire good, not madness, not death. You have inspired good, but you spat in the faces of Gotham's criminals. Things were always going to get worse before they got better. Deinonychus is, again, portrayed as the apex predator of early Cretaceous North America during the Aptian and Albion stages, being the main threat to sauropods. Um, did you forget somebody? If I had a nickel for every time this raptor was shown to be the top predator, as opposed to Acrocanthosaurus, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice, right? The Terrible Claw isn't the only victim here. Yeah, Parasaurolophus is done dirty too. I know I'm weird for calling it Parasaurolophus when others say Parasaurolophus or Parasaurolophus, but the narrator doesn't try at all. He goes with Parasaurophilus. Did no one in the studio bother to correct him? Why? This herbivore is also treated like a defenseless meat sack. Except for something I'll mention soon, but this wasn't the case. At over 30 feet in length and 2.5 metric tons, healthy adults would have crushed any predator. Gorgosaurus, Aspletosaurus, and Teratophonius would have been clapped. This does not mean that Parasaurolophus used sound blasts from their crest to fight predators. <laughs> <laughs> you serious? Yes, you heard me right. Clash of the Dinosaurs claims that they used infrasound and loud trumpeting to fight off attackers and one another. This is a joke, right? This had to be some prank that went way too far. It's that outrageous. But wait, there's more. The toxic Vex bite is back in all its absurdity. Yes, if an animal was bitten by a rex, the wound can get an infection, but that goes with any predator, or any injury for that matter. There's no evidence for some super secret special bacteria in their teeth. And there's also no evidence for Quetzalcoatlus being able to see urination trails with ultraviolet vision. Man, who comes up with this stuff? Why am I doing research for these videos when I could just be making up some random crap for entertainment value? Then there's Sore Poseidon. Oh boy. If you know, you know, but I won't get ahead of myself. The overall design is good enough, I'll leave that alone. However, for the younglings, the design sucks. Despite recommendations from the paleo experts, they're really just scaled down versions of the adults, which is instantly striking. Babies obviously don't immediately look like their parents. And despite an overall good design, their T-Rex is way too tall, reaching a shoulder height of 18 feet. That thing was tall enough to reach beyond the mysterious beyond, out past the smallest light that's twink- Uh, sorry, I keep getting lost in that amazing song. Where was I? Oh yes, the Rex in real life reached only 12 feet at the hips. Another issue that occurs throughout the docuseries is its settings, since they're very unclear. If I didn't know any better, I would have to assume that all the animals featured lived and died at the same time. The environments all look the same, a super foggy forest that looks like it was made for a 2013 Slender game. It doesn't help either that the narrator only refers to the different times as all just the Cretaceous. Yeah, each subject did live in the Cretaceous, but that covers a span of 80 million years. Do you have the slightest idea how little that narrows it down? Heck, clips of Tyrannosaurus and Parasaurolophus are even interwoven, implying there was a predator-prey relationship between the two. That kind of thing can only happen in Animal Junction. The writers could have at least said late or early Cretaceous, and that's not to mention all the many stages. Deinonychus and Sorposidon lived in the early Cretaceous, Aptian, and Albion stages around 110 million years ago. Parasaurolophus lived in the late Cretaceous, Campanian, 75 million years ago, and the rest of them came from the Maastrichtian, 66 million years ago. And finally, I've saved the worst for last, quote mining. It isn't the fun, innocent kind with diamonds and creepers, no. Quotes are taken out of context from the paleontologist's guests, so the creators can secretly push their own fake narratives. It's bad enough to see this in the news, does it have to happen in our dino shows too? 
The controversy centers around expert Matthew Weedle, an expert on sauropod dinosaurs who appears in many different segments throughout the show's runtime. During episode 3, The Defenders, he's asked about a peculiar gap in the hips of Sorposidon and its relatives, whether or not it housed an almost second brain. Like any good paleontologist would, Weedle dismissed that hypothesis, instead explaining the somewhat mysterious organ called the glycogen body that probably helped with energy storage. All was well and good, until Clash of Dinosaurs aired. Imagine the shock when he saw his interview be totally butchered to heck, so it can seem like he supported the second brain hypothesis. I have no words. Nothing. Listen, Discovery, when paleontologists are giving you their time and their knowledge to help make a documentary, treat them with some double shrecking respect. This is... This is insane. Oh gosh, well, after Weedle rightfully complained to Dangerous Pictures, this segment was edited out of future airings and DVD copies. At least it's something. His blog post on the experience is linked in the description, and I suggest reading it, since there are several other problems he brings up. For the sake of time, I won't bash every detail, like really, do I need to complain about epicipitals again, or pronated wrists? But like our Ninth Amendment fellow Americans, just because it wasn't written down, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. The problems are still there. Too bad I used my second amendment to blast a TV screen while watching this. Dang, that was tough to get through. I would rather 100% Batmobile Arkham Knight again than rewatch this. So many tank battles. Not only is Clash of the Dinosaurs a terrible show with endlessly looping footage, a bland script, and four episodes that all say slight variations of the same thing, but it's horrible when it comes to the facts too. There are legitimate merits to be given to the Discovery Channel and Dangerous Pictures on their T-Rex and Quetzalcoatlus, but there is no way in Shrek's Green Swamp that I can support a dinosaur documentary that mistreats its consultants and very purposefully misinforms its audience. And that's on top of all the failures already plaguing this series. There's no debate. Clash of the Dinosaurs deserves a long, cold F. Well, that sucked. Maybe someday I'll make a review on The Last Day of the Dinosaurs because there was already so much to cover in the episodes alone, but not right now. I need a mental health break from this cinematic universe. Disregarding that loose end, we're emerging from the Dark Age into what I'm calling the Dino Doc Renaissance with the March of the Dinosaurs. Get ready for programs to actually try again. But until then, please remember to leave a like, subscribe, and check out my social media. See you next time.